Good evening, everybody. Can you all hear me? Loud and clear. 7.30. Uh, be, welcome to the Butte Silver Road Council Commissioners Committee of the whole meeting, Wednesday, January 27th, 2021. Could I have roll call, please? Uh, we have 10 present, one presiding, and we have one absent, John Reardon. Okay. Thank you. I believe John's here. Um, <laughs> I thought he was too, but I was just told by our, our trustee. Okay. Uh, is John checked in? Well, I believe John is here. So we'll just say 11 present, one presiding. Thank you. All right, moving along. Uh, Commissioner Sorge, could you lead us in prayer? Thank you, Chairman. Almighty God, we implore you, look up as we make decisions which will greatly affect our community at Butte Silver Ball. Direct our words and deeds so that we please you and best serve our fellow citizens. Amen. Thank you, Commissioner Shaw, Commissioner Sorge. I am Commissioner Shaw. Public comment on any item on tonight's agenda. And uh, we will wait to see if there are any calls coming in. Anybody can call in. They're welcome to come at 497-5009. Uh, there are no written comments for this portion of our meeting. We're just checking our phone lines. Look like we have any calls coming in. And we have no calls coming in at the moment, but we'll leave the phone lines open for the future rest of this meeting. All right, moving along to the report of the chair. Uh, I really don't have a report tonight. We have a kind of could be a busy evening, so we'll just move right along into our next section which is section one, bid openings, public hearings and presentations. Number one, presentations, communication number 2021-37, Bob Lazary, Recreation and Special Event Coordinator, requesting council commissioners concurrence and authorization to give a brief presentation on the recently completed Highland View Clubhouse on January 27th this evening. Committee of the whole meeting. I see Mr. Lazary is on the line, so uh, the floor is yours, Bob. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, Council Commissioners. Thank you for allowing us time tonight to share this presentation on the improvements of the Stratton Park, specifically the new Highland View Clubhouse and upcoming revisions on the golf course. Um, this successful progress was made possible from the generous donations from the uh, Dennis and Fields Washington Foundation and Montana Resources. This success was possible from the team efforts with the architects from SMA, uh, site management from WET, uh, the general contractor, Langless Construction, uh, their subcontractors, um, the Butte Silver Bow Budget Office, uh, the Butte Silver Bow County Attorney's Office, and Parks and Recreation. This is truly a team effort. Um, to opening the clubhouse soon. And we hope you and the community share our enthusiasm. Um, Mark Fisher will present the PowerPoint on the clubhouse. And then Anthony Laslovich from WET will present the upcoming improvements on the golf course. Um, so thanks for everything, guys. Uh, here's Mark. Mark Fisher, you're on. 
<laughs> Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Commissioners. Um, can I just ask that we, I can share my screen so I can get to my PowerPoint presentation, please? Yes. I, I don't know if anybody can ever please see. We're working on it, Mark. We're okay. Getting, okay. <laughs> just let me know if everybody can see it and then I can move forward. Thank you. Okay, we will do. Madam Chair, if I may remind everybody that's not speaking to please mute your microphone so we don't get feedback. Mark, I believe you can begin. Okay. So again this is uh, welcome to the new highland view clubhouse i'm excited for this new opportunity that has been presented to us i, I do want to go back and bob ed and thank a lot of people but due to the generosity of the the washington foundation um mr um mike mcgivern and definitely with uh, chief executive palmer or chief executive gallagher i'm sorry that um, this come to flourishing so I'd like to get into um, what we're going to entail on this opportunity of how we're going to move forward and what it looks like. And I, I hope everybody's excited as I am as we move forward into this situation. And Mark, excuse me, but I believe you need to push the share button so that we can oh. see your presentation. <laughs> Didn't want to interrupt you, but. Oh, I they might. Okay, let me get back into this. There we go. I'm waiting for our technology folks here to make sure right. it goes through. It's, it's yeah. starting now. Yep. There we go. Can everybody see it now? Yes, we can. Thank you, Mark. Perfect. All right. <laughs> here we go. Okay, so this is a brand new facility for Butte Silver Bowl. Um, this facility is 5,700 square feet. Um, compared to our old one, which was over a little bit under 2,000 square feet. Um, this will incorporate uh, a full golf shop and golf shop slash pro shop at 585 square feet. I don't want to get into the details of the square footage, but this does have a full restaurant and kitchen and a dining area, um, which, which is a little bit over 2,000 square feet. Also incorporating the outside deck which is uh, over 1,100 square feet. Um, we do have two TrackMan simulators. Uh, we were the only ones in Montana that actually have TrackMan. Um, there is simulators in, in Montana, but we were the first ones to actually have TrackMan. And anybody that's a golfer, I'm gonna just give a little quick insight on it that um, TrackMan is everything that the PGA, LPGA, that that's how they track the shots. We so the technology is a double radar system. Uh, we do have a conference room um, with up to ten individuals that can be seated in this conference room. Uh, we have TVs throughout the facility, and we are actually going to move into rather than a seven to eight month operation, we're actually going to be moving into a full year round operation due to the simulators. So I'm gonna kind of move into what we're going to, what the facility looks like and how we're going to move forward. So bear with me. So this is the picture of the very front of the facility. Um, so this is the actual clubhouse and the pro shop. This is where we'll be dealing with the day-to-day -day operations during the summer, where we'll be renting carts, taking green fees, um, selling merchandise. Uh, this is the conference room. Um, so this is a 10 seated conference room in regards to, we have intentions of what we're gonna do with this, we don't know yet. Um, this will be a decision making factor that we will move forward to if we're gonna rent it out or not. So this is our, our actually our dining area. Um, 
we have 48 seats available right now. I'm going to, so this is actually behind the bar. And as you can see, based upon the decision of, we put this out to, to the public and to um, the Parks and Rec Board that we did name this, we, the Jack W. Crowley Jr. Clubhouse, just with his, with, with his naming up there. Um, so this is the two simulators. So there is only, so like Butte Country Club only has one simulator. Um, Helena has three simulators, but we are the only ones, again, that has TrackMan. TrackMan's a little bit more diverse. It's a little bit more accurate, and it's for club swinging purposes. You have a little bit more open space. So this would be, I call the hydration station or the bar. Um, so this is where we would actually be serving beverages to the public, to patrons that are going to be sitting in there. The, the bar area, the hydration station, um, well, we, we only have a beer and wine license right now. And so this would be where we'd be serving those. So this is the, the actual kitchen. So we do have a beverage station behind the kitchen, and I don't want to go into grave detail about this, but I can tell you that we do have like a, uh, I'll go kind of just down the quick list of, we've got a coffee, tea, hot chocolate machine. We have basically all of your beverages required. Uh, this is the kitchen cook line. So there's a four fryer grill top. Um, you have a, flat top, six burner, and above you would have a, a salamander. This is the prep table if we're gonna be making sandwiches or stuff like that with microwave, hot table underneath. Uh, we do have the ability, well, this has a walk-in cooler and a walk-in freezer. This is the back outside patio deck. Um, with outside seating for the summertime, even the wintertime. There's, I've talked with a few people in Helena, they actually tarp this off and then they, they actually put heaters in there, but that's uh, something in the future. So again, so we're gonna go back to, what does this mean for Butte Silver Bowl? Well, this is gonna be a year round operation. This is going to be an increase in golf operations for Butte Silver Bowl because we will be offering we will be offering year-round service. It is my intentions to partner with the local hospitalities to create a stay and play package where we can go to. I'm just going to throw out a, a just a hotel. I'm going to say the Hampton and offer them time in the simulators for people to come down and say, okay, I want to golf for the weekend in the winter time. So I, I do want to partner with local businesses. I think this will generate great revenue, not only on the hospitality side, but it will also generate on the businesses of food. It could, you know, bring in business of retail. Um, so again, this is going to be a year round recreation these golf simulators will be around. This is something we can do in the summertime, we can do in the wintertime. And this is a, a, a golden opportunity to showcase Stodden Park. Um, Stodden Park is probably the best community for Butte, Montana. And not only for Butte, Montana, but for all of Montana, this is the destination park. And we now have the ability to help showcase this based upon marketing that we can showcase it as a year-round amenity. And this will require additional staffing for this new facility because we are open year-round. Unfortunately, we, we are budgeted on a seven to eight month opportunity of, you know, bringing in help but with being year-round. We're, we're, I definitely need help. I can't do this by myself. So this is the intentions of what we have talked about um, based upon what we have talked, we have researched this, that we're going to have the simulators will cost $25 per hour, not per person, but per hour. 
We have two simulators, so that's basically entails $50 per hour. Um, it definitely will increase the uh, merchandise and the beverage sales because we're going to have a captive audience that can sit there and they might want a golf ball, so they might want a club, they might want to do demo days or something where they're going to go in and they're going to buy a golf ball or they're going to definitely have to have drinks or something. Uh, so back to the kitchen aspect of it. Um, I'm not a expert in the kitchens. It would be our intentions to, to lease out the kitchen aspect of it. And again, this would generate more revenue for Butte Silver Bow and the taxpayers. It would also be my intentions to run this from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. The subject of, uh, it would be, you know, until, in, in because again, this is a blank slate. We don't know what we're getting into, but this could change. It could go to less hours. We don't know because this is uncharted territory for, for us because we actually don't know what's going to happen. If we should go and lease the kitchen, we would put out an RFP request and lease in the kitchen facility. The lease amount would be determined by the RFP and the submittals and, and just following the protocol of how we should do the RFP. And based upon my conversations with individuals that do this, I think we should require a reserve um, based upon, I've talked with numerous people that, you know, the minimum right now is $100 per day on a lease. I, I think we could generate more, but I don't know how the RFP would come in. So this is up, up in arms right now. So again, you know, the whole big saying, if you build it, they will come. I would right now would like to extend my offer to have any of the commissioners come down and view this privately. Um, you can contact myself, my number's there, or you can just call the golf shop, or if you can contact Bob Lazary, and his number's below us. I would love to give you guys a tour. And so you can, I know the pictures are vague, but once you actually physically get in the building, you'll, you'll see it, it's actually amazing. So again, I would just want to go back to, so this is just phase one of the, all everything that's going down with Sodden Park with the, with the golf course side of it. There is a phase two, and this is going to be um, where we're going to be doing some, some great things on the golf course and with the irrigation, with some new tee boxes, with um, some landscaping. And this is where I would like to have Anthony Lazovich from WET. He's got a little bit more information on it than I do. So I would like to in, like to invite him into this situation and he can advise you guys of what actually phase two would be. So if you have any questions for me, I would be most I would be happy to answer. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Anthony, do you want to jump in? And then we'll open up the questions after that. Um, and I'm chair and members of the council, uh, Mr. Chief Executive. My name is Anthony Lazovich. I am a project manager for Water and Environmental Technologies. It is an absolute honor to participate tonight in providing an update on, on this great uh, Stodden Central Improvement Plan project. I would like to echo Mr. Lazary's and, and Mr. Fisher's comments uh, in recognizing the Washington Foundation and Montana Resources uh, in their, their generosity of $10 million that uh, made this, this project possible. We would not be talking here tonight uh, if that wasn't uh, in place. So uh, as Mr. Fisher mentioned, we're on the final stretch of the, the improvement as a whole, and I'm gonna provide a quick uh, update on what remains. And uh, for those of you who were present during the October 14th, uh, 2020 meeting, I get a real similar update. And uh, it, it's just a rundown of what remains, which is solely on, on the golf course side of things. And as uh, Mark mentioned, they include irrigation upgrades to the existing irrigation system, which include uh, updates to the irrigation pond. Uh, we're going to reconfigure the inlet configuration to make that more productive. 
we're going to redevelop the existing irrigation wells and there's a, a wide network of wells throughout the park which will be brought back to life and uh, we're going to uh, be constructing approximately 12 tea boxes throughout the course and then the uh, addition of a new putting practice area that uh, will live right outside the new golf course uh, the new clubhouse facility and then uh, the, the final portion of it will be uh, upgrades to the landscaping on the order of 56 trees, I believe will be uh, incorporated into the golf course, along with some upgrades to the, the fencing as well. Uh, so that's the, 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 the scope that's remaining for us to complete. And uh, due to it, this being specialty scope, specifically the majority of that scope being irrigation upgrades and what we'll call a commercial irrigation upgrade efforts, uh, we, we are going to recommend we solicit subcontractor bids uh, to the public and and receive those bids and have those that that scope of work be overseen by the, the leadership of Langless, who is currently our GCCM general uh, contractor construction manager on site. So what that'll look like is we will publish a bid uh, as everyone's familiar with uh, for a three week duration. And once we receive the bids, we will confirm that they are responsive. And then at that point, we will uh, submit a communication to council and request approval to amend Langless's A133 contract, uh, which will in turn uh, increase their guaranteed maximum price to include the scope of work. And we're hoping to be in a position to present uh, to, to the council at the end of February to allow this work to get under contract and teed up and uh, under construction for a mid-year completion. And of course, this is all weather dependent. So with that being said, that's that's kind of the, the 10,000 feet looking down on what remains of this great you know, five to six year project that's gone by in the blink of an eye. And I'd be happy to answer any questions anybody might have on work that's been completed to date or the work that remains. Thank you, Anthony. Are there any questions from council members for either Mark or Anthony? Commissioner Sorge? And then Commissioner Shea. John, you're uh, muted. Thank you, Chairperson Chow. I just want to say that it's been a long time coming. This that other uh, clubhouse is there was a long time, you know, and I guess in my mind, this kind of puts the cherry on top for a, for a great park that we have, the, you know, the Stodden Park, and we all should all, it is one of the nicest parks in the state that we should all take great pride in, uh, you know, it, it becoming a destination uh, for people to want to come to. Um, I do have a question for uh, Mark, Mark Fisher. Uh, Mark, so the memberships, is going to be just still the seven month membership for the golf. You're not going to do a yearly membership or anything like that, or have you even thought of anything like that? As of right now, um, thank you, C Commissioner Sorge. Um, as of right now, I'm I'm going to stay with the the pass holder fee is going to be for the outside greens, and uh, I want to stick with the it's the twenty five dollars per hour for the members or for the use of the golf course. Yes, I, I don't want to do a yearly one because what would happen is then they would take up all of the time and then on the membership and then I would not get the outside people in to use the actual facility. So I, I would, I'm going to keep it with just the pass holder, which is the, the green grass members. Thank you, Mark. You're welcome. Commissioner Shea, did you have a question? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Commissioner Sorich addressed my question, okay. but I, I do want to take the time to um, just tell Mr. Fisher and Mr. Laslovich how wonderful it looks. I can't wait to see it. Thank you. And uh, Commissioner Fredrickson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Mr. Fisher. Uh, yeah, I would encourage everyone to take uh, that offer to uh, take a look at it. We've had our, our Parks and Rec board meeting in that conference room. We were all wearing masks, by the way. Uh, but uh, 
And so I got to see it. Get, I got to get a tour, and it, it's it's amazing. It's so nice. Um, so you should you should definitely um, take a tour. And Mark, I had a, a question and a comment. The, first of all, a comment is I drove by there, and it, it is amazing to see from the outside. And I can't wait to get a, a tour of the inside. But I, and I had a question; it was answered. But maybe you could share this with the rest of council. Is the old clubhouse? Um, could you just explain what the plan is for that? Yeah, Madam Chairman. So the old clubhouse has actually been turned into cart storage. It's actually going to be year-round cart parking. Um, I can't give you a definite answer of how many carts we can fit in there right now because they're actually just finishing up exactly what can, how many carts I can fit in there. So it would be our intentions to actually rent out spaces throughout the year and then they could have year-round cart storage with, we've got two garage door openings, um, they can go out. Um, it would be actually the south side and the east side and um so until i can actually they can physically get done with it then i can stripe it and then i can start renting out spaces but that is our intentions is to rent out the spaces thank you any other questions from council members well thank you both mark and anthony and Laz, for your presentation it's it's a positive thing we're all looking forward to spring in one way or another but thanks again i thank you very much council Okay, moving on to our second presentation. This is communication 2021-40. Michelle Shea, Commissioner District 2, requesting Council of Commissioners concurrence and authorization to have a presentation on January 27th from Cassie Wick and Todd Hoare to discuss their observations resulting from a walking audit around Whittier School. Uh, Commissioner Shea, would you like to introduce our guest? Thank you, Madam Chair. I would love to introduce them. Um, so Cassie Wick and Todd Hoare joined myself, uh, Commissioner Minkins, Commissioner Fredrickson, and Public Works Director Mark Neary um, to do a walking audit around the Whittier School. I was asked by some parents from the area to look at the safety issues that they see. There's a lot of traffic around there, um, much more traffic than that school was designed to have around it because years ago more kids walked to school and now kids more kids get rides so we thought that cassie and todd could come and do a walking on it and they came up with some really great ideas that will hopefully in the end number one make it safer for everybody but number two encourage children to walk to school again so it's my pleasure to introduce um cassie wick and todd Hoare. cassie and todd the hi yes thank you for having us so share the We're working on our end, our end too. Oh, sorry. Well. There we go. Okay, perfect. So we're going to do a little background um, on walkability before we get into the traffic calming section. So we will do our best to make this as brief as possible in consideration of your time. So um, Todd and I are both members of the Butte Silver Bow ADA Advisory Committee. And um, if you haven't seen us at a council meeting, we are walkability enthusiasts for Butte. So for just a moment, um, we just want everyone to kind of take a second and think about when you were young and what are some of those best memories from being young? Maybe it was riding bikes or playing in a creek by your house, building a fort. Probably wasn't spending time inside playing video games or uh, doing things like that. And so keep that in mind as we go through this presentation because we really are trying to get back to how do we get kids feeling safe on our streets again. So it is a myth that people do not walk or bike in Butte. Um, and we may or may not have had this discussion with council in the past. The best thing about winter is it tells a story. So we know people walk in Butte because if you look at any sidewalk that has been unshoveled, you will see footprints in that snow. We also know that the Butte bus provides 360 rides per day. That means that every person that rides our local bus system has to walk from their home to their work to any destination they have in anywhere in between. So keeping that in mind, um, our buses accommodate bicycles. Uh, this is a major form of transportation. So as we go through this presentation, uh, Todd and I both drive, so we are not anti-car. Um, but what we also know is that not everyone in our community has the ability to drive. 
So we need to take everyone into consideration um, as we move through our streets. And as we talk about traffic calming, it's just a reminder for yourself that when you're in your car and you find yourself driving a little too fast in an area you know you're not supposed to be driving fast in, why are you doing that? And just keeping that in mind um, as we go through this. So our background is we are not experts. We are real excited about it. And we are really excited about it because we met with a gentleman named Mark Fenton, who is a national expert on walkability. He is um, in the photograph on the right. Uh, we are in this picture doing a curb extension um, across the street from the Mother Lode Theater uh, because that intersection is very wide and it can be very dangerous for people to cross. So we were trained by him how to do walk audits and he he really drove home how important walkability is to a community, not just for the citizens' health, but also for the economic vitality of a community. So we are also, of course, accessibility advocates because we both work in disability. And so when we're doing these improvements, we wanna make sure we're taking into account every single citizen that lives in Butte Silver Bow. And we would just do a shout out to Stodden Park. It is the perfect example of doing something right in Butte Silver Bow. It is completely accessible to every person that lives in our community and we should be incredibly proud of that. So as Michelle said, we did a walk audit uh, in December. And so um, these conversations have come from that. So walkability has economic, health and safety and environmental benefits. Traffic calming measures are an important piece of the puzzle when designing for pedestrian safety in communities and around schools. So we're gonna be talking about Whittier School, but if you have a school in your district, I really want you to start thinking about what it looks like uh, for that school. So here we are in this photo um, at the Northwest Energy Building, um, a really important example of a building that was done right. Uh, they, they built the building so that it's walkable. You can get right to the entrance. It's accessible for all. There's bike racks. They have beautiful lighting for pedestrians. If you walk by Northwest Energy, you recognize immediately that that's a place that you want to be outside in front of because it feels comfortable. So that's a big part of walkability that we will cover today. So we're going to talk about changes in biking, walking, car rides to school, health benefits of active transportation, the four elements to active transportation, traffic calming, uh, projects, programs, and policies, and suggestions uh, for Whittier School. So this is uh, from 1969 to 2001. So this was a 30 year study that shows that kids were walking and biking to school and getting a lot less car rides. And now 50 years later, if you go to Whittier School in the morning, you would be horrified by the way the traffic is driving in every direction to drop kids off in a hurry. Kids are darting in and out of cars. I mean, it is scary because uh, so many cars are there people feel less likely to send their child by foot or by bike. So some of the reasons for this is people are, uh, we're two parent or we're, we're two parents are working in families now. And so that gives less time with children. And so people feel like that's my time with my kid as I'm gonna drop them off at school and I'm gonna pick them up. That's something a loving parent does. And so what that's done is it's created a lot of congestions around schools. We also have more access to technology, so we have a lot more fear related to things. People are texting and driving. They may not be paying attention to your child. It can be really scary to let them walk. The issue with this is sometimes, or a lot of kids are getting a lot less exercise than they were back in the 60s and 70s and 80s. Um, and so we now have a high rate of type 2 diabetes in youth. Um, and it's said that this is the first generation of kids that probably will not outlive their parents due to sedentary lifestyle um, and higher risk of uh, chronic conditions. So we also might not be making it accessible for kids to walk to school. So this is a picture from last week. Todd and I went to Whittier School. Um, the snow has been shoveled in the crosswalk. So if a child wants to cross, it's not really inviting to do so. You can also see that the sidewalk has kind of been shoveled, but there's a lot of snow and ice there, so it doesn't really feel safe. Todd and I stood on the other side of this crosswalk after school. The kids uh, keenly were jumping on top of that snow pile, looking both ways and then jumping off that snow pile so they knew it was safe to cross. Um, but overall, it's not that inviting to cross there. They're also walking to school. They are walking to school, but no one's shoveling for them to walk to school. So um, if you aren't shoveling your sidewalk now, if you have one in front of your house, please do so because people are walking in there and the more people are walking on these sidewalks, the more ice builds up and the more dangerous it becomes to get to the places you're going. We also have, um, we also require people to get a permit when they're gonna get a sidewalk in front of their home. And for a long time, 
people were just putting sidewalks wherever they wanted to. So if you try to walk in Whittier School District, the sidewalks are disjointed. So you might have a sidewalk, no sidewalk, a sidewalk that's in, a sidewalk that's out. It's not continuous for anyone to use. So it's actually not that inviting to walk in that area for several of the blocks around there. So we all know we should be physically active. They, we should be getting 150 minutes of moderate physical activity week. Any movement is better than none as an adult. We know that. Children should be getting up to five hours a week of physical activity. I don't, we're probably not getting that. Obviously the benefits are vast. You're gonna be healthier for a million reasons. Um, less chance of diabetes, osteoporosis, uh, no dementia potentially, cancer. But mostly we're not getting the exercise we need. You know, this picture on the top right is cars lined up to drop kids off at school. We know that's happening all the time. Um, there's lots of reasons to stay inside. Cell phones are keeping people from moving around. Our jobs keep us at home in front of computers. So we know that simply encouraging somebody and educating them does not work to make sure that you get exercise. This picture says, when I feel the need to exercise, I lie down until it goes away. <laughs> so what can help? So if we create a built environment in Butte that promotes and encourages an active lifestyle through thoughtful site design, people are more likely to be active. And we already know that. We're doing that in Butte. This is, this is your picture from Butte. We have so many beautiful amenities thanks to Butte Silver Bow's vision for this city. Our urban trail system is constantly busy because it feels safe to walk there. There are a few intersections you have to be careful. I mean, if anyone has tried to cross Excelsior, it is scary because that is a street people do not drive slow on. Um, but our skate park is important for children to get outside. Um, we have ski trails, we have ice skating. We have, I mean, we just have a vast amount of things to do. So we're doing a good job in that area, um, but we can do more in our, internal cities. So we can do more by making changes in our streetscapes to encourage more walking and biking trips instead of driving. So we like to talk about the example of if you go to Uptown Butte to stop somewhere and you park, you should only park one time if you're physically able to walk. We know some people are like, oh, I'm parked at Whiteheads and then I'm going to drive down to Taco del Sol. That's a really good opportunity for you to walk two blocks to get something to eat and walk back. That's accidental exercise. And that's good for you. Um, but if we built our, our environment to encourage that kind of behavior, more people are likely to do that. So um, healthy design has multiple community benefits. So healthy people, obviously. Our uh, Silver Bow uh, Community Health Needs Assessment, our top two concerns for Butte Silver Bow were mental health, which can be helped by being able to get outside safely and, and breathe in some fresh air and get some exercise. Our second concern is nutrition, physical activity, and weight. So this addresses those. A healthy economy, it is proven that if you build your city to be walkable, more people want to spend time there. And then obviously a healthy environment. So we're going to talk about the four elements that are active transportation and why it matters. So mixed land use. So Butte Silver Bow is going through a change right now. We're selling major properties that are likely going to be converted into condos. Why are people doing that? Because they're moving out of larger cities and they still want all those amenities. So when you do mixed use, you have shopping, you have, you know, where you work, where you play, you know, these are all pictures from Butte. Um, and we have all those things uh, minus a grocery store in Uptown Butte for people to be able to walk to. But it's the same on the flats. If you want to be able to walk to the grocery store, that's a desirable place to live. Our network of facilities is really important. And I know um, if you've been on the council for a while, we worked really hard to get bike lanes in town and we did it so that they were in a network of facilities. So when things connect, people are more likely to use them. Um, if they're disjointed, they don't encourage you to go all those places. So having sidewalks with curb cuts and bike lanes and non-motorized trails, those all encourage people to use them. We have those amenities and they're getting better all the time. And as someone that uses the bike lane on Main Street, People have gotten way more considerate since we first put it in, and it's been really easy and lovely to use. So if you have shorter blocks and more connections, um, our bus is free. If you've never ridden the Butte City Bus, uh, when you feel safe to do so, I would encourage you to do so, so you know where it goes in our town and how it serves the people of our community. It is free to everyone. It does not go everywhere you want it to go. Um, and that's why people have to walk to their destinations. 
And that's uh, another you know, plug for snow maintenance, really being aware of uh, the fact that we have people that wanna walk their children, walk their dogs, get to work. Um, but when we don't have proper snow maintenance um, in place, it makes it challenging to do so. So safety and access. So we're gonna start getting into what is traffic calming. So engineering can markedly improve safety and decrease you know, uh, pedestrian fatality. And so in the top left corner is a median island. Um, that is if an intersection is wide, and you can't make it all the way across, you can have kind of an area of safe refuge that you can stand in until you feel safe to cross. Obviously, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about roundabouts. Roundabouts are very effective in slowing traffic down and they're actually better for cars because they keep your car moving. I don't know if you've been at a four-way stop in view, but everyone is constantly confused about what who goes next. So a roundabout uh, allows traffic to continue to move. Um, some of our favorite, uh, methods of traffic calming are curb extensions. And they are important because nothing is worse than not being aware of what a pedestrian is going to do. A curb extension really allows you to know someone's intent to cross, and you're more likely to stop for a pedestrian if you see them there. They're also really important because they prevent someone from blocking that corner. And that's dangerous for drivers. Um, I live on Mercury Street, and the college students park all the way to the end on Excel. I cannot exit my street going that way because there's just no way for me to see past the cars. If there were curb extensions there, they wouldn't be able to do that. It would make it safer for a car to exit any of those streets because they can get out safely. Lane realignments are really important for traffic calming. We did this on Front Street a number of years ago, and we just most recently did it on Park Street. So it's when you do a road diet, you take five lanes or four lanes and you reduce them down to three. So as you can see in this picture, it would be really scary as a pedestrian to cross. It is also scary as a car to try to get across these lanes of traffic because you're not, it's not easy to see. So they take this road and then they do a road diet. And so you can see in this picture, they've added bike lanes. There's plenty of room to do that. They have traffic, just two lanes. If you're a pedestrian, you don't have to worry about a second car hitting you as you're trying to cross. Um, and you can just see right here, it makes you drive slower when you know that there's more action on a street. So site design again is really important. Obviously we all know that walking in Uptown View, it was designed for that. Many, many people were walking up there as opposed to this picture in the top right. Um, people walk down on Harrison Avenue, but it is scary because cars are going very fast and there is no barrier between you and those cars. Um, I like to bike to my office down there and I have to, I don't want to bike on the sidewalk, but there are times I have to because there's no way I would ride in that street. It's very scary. Um, and so site design matters because it, it appeals to you. If it, if it feels like a place you should walk, you tend to walk there. So site design matters, it's fully accessible. The building is on the sidewalk as opposed to being set back um, on the street. So in this picture of Walgreens, this is from Portland, Oregon. Portland is obviously known to be a walkable, bikeable city. What they had done was they were like, watching things be designed for cars. So they were putting parking lots with a long uh, distance between the sidewalk and the entryway. They said, we wanna build our stores so that they are pedestrian friendly. So they started building every Walgreens to be pedestrian friendly. And as you can see, they did it in Butte. You can see that they built this so that when you're walking, it's very easy for you from the sidewalk to get in and out of Walgreens. They still took into consideration cars, but they made it so every user feels like they can do that. This is really important because Town Pump just did a really big thing by making their site design important like this. They created pedestrian access. It's not in the front of the building, but it's along the side. They added pedestrian lights. They made the building look appropriate for Uptown Butte. Those are all things we can require as Butte Silver Bow so that everything is in keeping with creating uh, an environment for everybody. So obviously street trees, benches, art, lighting, all that's important. We um, we need a lot more pedestrian lighting in Uptown Butte if, if we're gonna be walking there. So just kind of be paying attention to those things. What makes me wanna walk here? Do I like walking here? Do I feel comfortable walking here? And if I don't, what are the reasons why? And then bike parking. Um, we see people riding their bikes all the time, but they have nowhere to lock them to. So if you say no one's riding a bike, they might not have a place to put it. So if we add those amenities, people have the opportunity to, to travel that way. And when people are walking around, they're more encouraged to spend money. So how do we achieve this? All right. Well, tough act to follow there. Um, 
how do we achieve this? Well, traffic calming can help. Um, the term traffic calming is new to some people. Um, it, it is just what it's saying is how do we how do we calm everybody down in tight situations? Um, traffic calming uses a variety of methods to slow the cars, but not ban them. We're not trying to get rid of cars. Um, as Cassie had said, we both own several of them. Um, but as we move through the commercial res residential neighborhoods, we need to calm things down. Um, sorry about that. Cars uh, now drive at speeds that are safer and more um, compatible to walking and biking when you calm them down and balances the multiple uses of a street. So no one mode can dominate at the expense of the other. So the benefits of the uh, traffic calming is improved feel. If people feel more comfortable on the streets, they're more likely to walk or bike. Um, so the key aspect of achieving this objective is reducing the perceived threat of danger from motor vehicle traffic. Again, trying to uh, uh, set, the, set the tone for calming. So several traffic calming techniques, uh, such as street landscape and pedestrian amenities, not only make the neighborhood more attractive, but they also break up long, uninterrupted streets uh, conducive to speeding and convey the message that this is a pedestrian-friendly place. Um, Bob Lazarus. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, reduce crime. You know, uh, this is an interesting one. It's harder to get away with uh, without being spotted breaking into cars if there's more people walking the streets, if more people are out in their neighborhoods. Um, equitable balance. Bob, did you still our ability to use <laughs> our screen? <laughs> All right, we're back. Um, with reduced motorist speed, safety is improved. Pedestrians and bicyclists have more time to detect and avoid motor vehicles. And then on the increased safety uh, in injury, traffic calming facility evaluates uniformly show fewer crashes, fewer fatalities, and less severe injuries um, in a calmer environment. So some strategies um, that we have uh, to go over are the medians, curb extensions, reclaim spaces with landscaping, uh, such as pedestrian and amenity parking, and then uh, narrow traffic lanes and slower points. So some of the ones that we have in Butte to kind of show you, um, and those of you who drove through the St. James complex, you can fill that median really narrows it down, slows you down automatically. Uh, they put in some of those uh, vibrating strips cut into the asphalt to let you know um, that you need to slow down. All, all those uh, techniques were designed to slow things down. Also lighting in the middle there, lights up, tra lights up the traffic and the, the walking lanes. Um, the mid block um, crossing that we have on Park Street, right where the uh, parking garage is, it's a great example of what Cassie was talking about with the um, the curb extensions. So that curb's pushed all the way out to the white line. Um, the pedestrian and the cars can see each other. How does that calm you down? If the if you've ever tried to cross the street where the car sees you really late, they slam on the brakes, good chance they're going to get rear-ended, um, and you don't know what their intentions are until they've slammed on their brakes. So all of this gives you the eyesight to actually see each other um, and cross. Great example of a um, curb extension. So the median island that Cassie had mentioned as well, this is on Harrison right there where the interstate is. Our trail system crosses going to Father Sheehan Park. Um, again, it's six lanes instead of, you know, uh, five or four. This is actually six lanes of traffic there. So some people might need the time to actually rest in the middle um, before they get to the other side. Um, probably had, could have a couple of uh, bollards uh, standing around it a little bit to, to just show that uh, it's a protected space, but nobody's gonna run into that. Um, they don't wanna hurt their car. Um, but a lot of this stuff is expensive to make these changes. And uh, some things that we've suggested in the past and others have suggested is to do some um, 
do some projects before you spend a lot of money on laying permanent concrete or um, asphalt before before you make these changes. Some of the things that we've all seen um, as an example of that are projects. Um, the three P's that we're going to go over, there's projects, uh, programs, and policies. So under projects, both Anaconda and us in Butte did some temporary parklet um, designs. And those parklets uh, gave us an opportunity to see how traffic would um, respond, how pedestrians would respond, and how inviting the space was and did you feel comfortable being there? And in that in that process, the, the programs brings on the infrastructure to actually build a more permanent or in our situation, a, a semi-permanent opportunity uh, for the summertime. The lower picture is the one that was we had set up uh, below the head frame a couple of years ago. And then that program can turn into policy where we really worked um, with O and MDT to, to actually develop a um, some policies that would uh, allow people to do this in a way that was safe and um, inviting to all citizens. Um, so the projects begin trying to do more stuff. Um, here's some examples that Mark had shared with us uh, throughout the Montana actually whitefish up on the top left is a bike to school day. Um, th they really wanted to encourage a dedicated bike lane and uh, people didn't know how that would look and without spending a bunch of money they just took their cones put them out um, and the lower picture you can see how many kids once they did that how many kids turned out to ride their bike to school that day. Um, some low cost uh, mini circles and some roundabouts, kind of a situation using hay bales, using cones. Um, obviously in the summertime, most of this stuff could, could happen in Butte. Uh, wintertime would have a little, diff little different situation depending on where we were trying to do some of these projects. Um, this project here, um, was a, a very busy street in Connecticut that just they could not slow the traffic down. People were driving way too fast. Um, and so an idea was is this very, very inexpensive roundabout, which required people to check down their speed, which kept the speed at a, a lower rate all over the place. Nice thing about roundabouts that I don't know if people really think about um, is that you always know which direction the vehicle is going. So you're not guessing, you're always knowing that it's gonna always be coming to you from the right. Um, just something to think about. Uh, this is in Missoula, again, uh, used uh, quite often like these in, in long streets. You can see how long that street is and to slow people from getting up to speeds that are not conducive for a residential neighborhood, they put in these what could be temporary roundabouts. I mean, there's nothing in here that couldn't be taken out at six o'clock at night and be fixed for the morning. So um, another project type of uh, um, roundabout implementation. Some other low cost options, um, Colorado Springs use these bollards, uh, Butte Silver Bow's using these with MDT. Uh, you can see that kind of a, a thing happening on Continental, um, going from Elizabeth Warren out to Three Bears, even on the east side of Continental for some of the kids going to Hillcrest. Um, that right hand one, using those bollards and paint, I mean, that is, uh, you know, not very much money right there to try a, a curb extension type of a, a corner there it slows people down driving and it also allows the pedestrian a feeling that they could step out there and not feel too threatened um, that they were going to get ran over trying to cross this one from vermont um it's kind of tough to see in these pictures i think but uh just to explain it just a little bit to you you can just see this small town it's really wide open you're pretty much just putting yourself out there not knowing if somebody's going to back into you pull off the street they spent a couple hundred bucks, it looks like, on these planners and some of those um, 
rubberized curb stops, created a walking space in between them, um, made a spot where people can't just pull off that highway, any old place. Um, and it just gives pedestrians a chance to do what Cassie was saying is park your car and walk to each one of these businesses without having to say, well, I'm going to pull into this business and then I got to drive to the next one when they're only a couple blocks away from each other. So again, programs, um, kind of designing what a program would look like is, uh, you know, like we talked about with our parklets, um, bike shares, colleges and hotels, and then a using wayfinding. Um, we had done that here in Butte with a, a small group to try and, try and see what uh, people wanted to see in, um, in using wayfinding. Um, so, uh, all of these programs lead to um, either scrapping the idea or going with it. So this one in Billings, Again, this is close to a school. They wanted this to be an, an extended curb. Um, slow traffic down and let pedestrians cross because this was a high pedestrian crossing zone. So they put in those rubberized um, curb stops and those two signs with a crosswalk, painted it, did it for a while to see what the response was and was able to uh, justify spending the money to do this permanent um, crossing, which is similar to the one I showed you on Park Street um, that we have. Um, those curb extensions are are worth their weight in, in gold, I believe. Um, showing a road diet design in on this New York Street, you can see they didn't they didn't paint the white lines along the side. They felt like this was a very, very fast uh, thoroughfare, but it was a lot of pedestrians walking. And it, as you look at this picture, to me as a, a walking enthusiast, I really like the boulevard um, buffers with the trees and the lighting. I really feel like you could walk up and down these sidewalks without really worrying too much about a car, um, except at intersections. Um, but biking, and you know, it, it just was really fast too, is what we've been told. So they did a road diet on this one, put in the bike lanes, um, the white lines on both sides, gave the car a definite spot to park, and um, the traffic uh, slows. It, it slows down because they're looking at those curb extensions that are in the center where the crossing is. They're looking for bikes because the bike lanes are painted. Um, that just calms, calms people down, slows them down. Um, some of the information that uh, has been shared with us and we, we look at quite often is, uh, in case you were wondering where we see a lot of these things, there's a couple of slides on that, betterblock.org, um, and then Slow Your Street. Um, so, uh, what does this have to do with the schools? Um, more more students are being driven. Uh, I don't think that's a secret to everybody, but how do we deal with that? Um, it causes the increased traffic around the schools to the point where it's just, it's very dysfunctional and very uh, not calming. <laughs> um, this increased traffic discourages parents from allowing students to walk and bike to school and students are missing opportunities for the autonomy and independence um, such as our memories that Cassie had talked about from our youth. Uh, lifelong health habits are formed when you walk and bike to destinations. And the emotional benefits, such as she talked about on our one of our number one on our health survey is mental health issues. Um, so we have some ideas that uh, why we went through everything we just went through. We wanted to give you some ideas of those types of um, amenities to maybe use around Whittier. Uh, as we were told, everybody used to either walk to Whittier or a couple of buses used to bring um, a few people there. So cars around there wasn't a problem when it was first built. And now, now it's really difficult. So we, we really need to get um, 
you know, the students that are talking to Michelle, um, while we were there, parents came up and asked us what we were doing there. Um, we need to get those parents and students involved because, you know, none of these changes are going to happen if uh, we're telling them how to be safe. They need to be a part of the solution. Definitely think curb extensions um, would be a benefit to uh, several of these corners to get these kids um, recognized as trying to cross the street when these cars are. Ottawa Street um, is very, very fast, very busy, um, as we noticed two different times when we were there. So median islands uh, could possibly help in uh, a couple of different areas to let uh, kids get out. Uh, I'm sorry, not kids get out, but cars to, to choke down their speed. Again, mostly on Ottawa and Yale tends to get some speed going. Um, possible street closures, you know, we don't really know um, without without doing some traffic studies uh, numbers wise. So we don't want to uh, say we're on the bandwagon to close all these streets. But, you know, Sherman Avenue does have the opportunity with looking at it uh, closely with the number of um, driveways and alleys that come into it there's really not a lot going on right in that section you might be able to use a closure at drop off and pick up time to help calm that area and then reconsidering the teacher parking space um on this picture you can see some of the spots that i was talking about ottawa street um is a stop there at sherman but it's there's no other stop between there and uh continental um that crosswalk that Cassie showed you with the, the snow mound that the kids were jumping off of is that arrow in the center, top center, where Banks crosses Ottawa Street. Um, probably be a really good spot for some curb extensions. Um, and in these spots, you can kind of see the teacher parking section here is the, those cars on the right. Um, uh, parking spaces behind between that and this so slide where that crossing is that had the mound cars are pulling in there uh dropping off and buses are pulling in there and that sign that's kind of sitting just right of center um so these cars are kind of hiding people kids trying to to dart in and out um not a lot of cars parking there the three times we were down there so maybe reconsider more the teachers park. Um, as Cassie was saying earlier, you can kind of see the, the hit and miss of sidewalks. This is a good example too. The whole north side of Ottawa down to that white mailbox, there is no, um, there are, there's no sidewalks um, until you hit that spot. And then there's a decent sidewalk with a, uh, a boulevard built in. Um, so this is that same stop. That uh, mound is kind of in the top left-hand corner. You can just see the base of it. But this was a morning picture taken. Um, most of the other ones we had observed were in the afternoon. But yeah, this guy's dropping off a, a student um, and there's a kid trying to cross at the same time. And uh, you can see he had to come out behind that truck and then that truck facing him was looking to the left trying to see if there was cars flying in any either direction and um it was at the last second that that dodge truck saw him and uh the neighbors and the you know that probably talked to michelle as well or i'm sorry commissioner shay um you know, the same thing as kids are just kind of darting all over the place. Cars are darting all over the place. And it's a very fearful morning for a lot of kids. And but then it turns to, I want to walk to school, but I'm afraid to. So then the parents of the kids that are actually walking to school are now driving them to school. So it's, it's getting worse instead of better. Um, so some ideas on that traffic calming, um, on, on the project side of, of having it a little less expensive is some 
and maybe getting some of the kids involved is painting curb extensions and putting some of the bollards up, such as in this picture. Here's a picture of a school that did just that, partnered with Public Works, and they uh, they did the stenciling design uh, at their shop, and then the kids did the painting. Um, this big picture on the left shows they did this as their drop-off pickup zone, so it's very, very clear um, where where all of that is happening. Um, again, and it's tough to see in there, but there's bollards and some a couple of planters and stuff because we'll need those in the uh, winter months when you won't be able to see the nice paint covered up with snow and ice. But um, again, just ways to get the community involved and when the kids are involved and they're understanding safety, um, they're talking to their parents about it and it, it creates a safer environment just because pe more people are talking about it. So recommendations, um, immediate steps should be taken for safety, uh, such as crossing guards, some flags, proper snow maintenance, um, and then talking about the teacher parking uh, changes and uh, flagging off some of the problem areas so that uh, cars aren't trying to go through areas that we don't want them going through. Um, again, involve the parents and students to identify areas of concern uh, now so projects can begin. They'll probably tell us ways that they're asking their kids to be safe and give us some ideas on how they're walking to school. And then you know, not to spend a bunch of money, but bring in an expert for school safety. Um, we, we did work with uh, an engineer on some of the uh, safe routes to school a few years ago, and we definitely saw some benefits. And I think a lot of the, um, the Emerson changes happened because of that. And then start paying attention to other areas um, around you to create a more beautiful, vibrant and walking space. Um, again, turning to that policy side of the three P's that I talked about earlier. And so we just wanted to close with this picture of what you used to look like, cars and people everywhere. Living um, in harmony. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe we can get back to that. But we really appreciate it and we'd definitely uh, be open to any questions or And we're comments. happy to do a walk audit in anyone's district. We've done a few of them. Um, and so if that's something you're interested in to get a better kind of idea in your own neighborhood, we would love to take you. And, and even, winter is a better time to do a walk audit because it tells a really big story about where cars are turning, um, who's using the space. And if you don't think people are walking really, really look at any patch of snow and you will see footprints in that snow. And in any, any uh, parent group or um, student group that do you think would benefit from that as well? We're, we're very open to taking them on a walking audit and showing some of this stuff as well. And in any school, this doesn't have to be just this Whittier situation because we're pretty sure it's happening in most every. We've, we've heard, heard from, from all the other schools. Yeah, we've too. already heard yeah. from. Well, thank you, Cass and Todd. That was a, a great presentation, very uplifting and things that can be done that have been done and have worked. Um, my district has Kennedy School, which has always been a kind of an adventure. Uh, same thing with traffic flow and just a very tight area. Um, but are there any other council members who have questions for Cass and Todd on this? Commissioner Mankins. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair Shaw. And uh, thank you again, uh, Cassie and Todd, for presenting that uh, presentation and uh, opening some eyes to a lot of, a lot of us. Um, one of the questions I do have, though, you talked about a safe route school at the end of your presentation. Todd was talking about it with Emerson. What were some of the things that were done from Emerson from prior to now? Can I answer, Todd? Um, Commissioner Rankin, the, I think the main thing that happened there was changing it to one-way streets. Um, they had done a lot of studying over over I think two summers. And I, I don't think the, to be honest with you, I don't think the, the number one idea was to go one way streets um, just because of the effect that was happening to a lot of the neighbors. Um, but it, it really has calmed, calmed it down. Did it fix it all the way? No, because 
we're still having record number of drivers uh, going there. But traffic calming, the whole idea behind it is you're not going to get rid of the vehicles. You're just trying to predict, you know, you're trying to give the pedestrian and the driver a prediction of what, what each of your intentions are. Follow up, Commissioner Mankin, and then Commissioner Sorge. Uh, thank you again, Madam Chair. Um, so with that, with Emerson, so when you brought the uh, specialists in, what was the cost of that? And then who was responsible for that cost at that time? And I have another follow-up too. Um, so um, I, Gina, I think Gina Evans um, at that time had gotten a grant for Safe Routes to School, which was a nationwide push at that time. Um, <clears throat> and Safe Routes to School is really determining feeder streets into a school um, and it's expressed through doing walking school buses and you know testing out where would people walk and what are the safest routes to get to a school on foot or bike so that was all done through a grant and as that was done they started to determine what streets took priority like where were the most students that possibly would walk or bike where were they coming from um that was probably seven years ago that we did that so it's been a while but there is a safe the safe routes to school is something you can look up and i i don't know if there's still a coordinator in montana but we can look into that for sure and and on that what? same note uh commissioner makins is the uh the cost of that program was long it was it was community wide but um to bring in a, a person to do a specific um study of let's say whittier uh, it wouldn't be as extensive as what we had had with that grant. And we already have the Safe Routes to School lined out to Whittier School. So they're already established from when we did the Safe Routes to School at that time. And we can find those. One more follow-up, Commissioner Rankins. So have you, um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Have you, Cassie or Todd or anyone, you know, have you, have you asked the school district of what, you know, it seems like the school district, um, possibly probably has the responsibility of some of this as well. Um, I know that we've had some different issues on our commission before from Hillcrest having blinking lights that we all believe that we know work 100%. I think if you're a speeder and you had a blinking light and you've seen that you've said that you're going too fast, you're an automatic, take your foot off the gas and touch the brake. Um, I know that's the most expensive thing, but that is the most effective thing. Uh, I know I like the idea of the going outside of the box from your tour and showing these different uh, uh, curb outlets, which I like a lot. Uh, I think that would benefit a lot of our schools and to uh, uh, benefit um, our little ones. And uh, hopefully we get more walkers. And I really like that idea that, you know, getting something out there to the schools and maybe having that bike day and having those kids start walking back to school. Um, so hopefully people are out there listening and, uh, the powers to be and uh, we get things going on when the uh, spring hits. Yeah, Thank and you. and we are grateful that you guys uh, gave us this opportunity to speak about this because it really is important. But if you've never heard of any of these terms or any of these ideas, um, you don't know they exist and why they matter. And so we, we would love to give the same presentation to the school because it really is going to take everyone in Butte starting to really look at the different places we can do better um, and, and its impact. So. Yeah, and, and to follow up to Commissioner Makins, you're right. I mean, there's there's many things that we saw down there that um, I'm sure you're not going to be able to uh, to force them, uh, you know, to change the teacher parking space, for instance. So I mean, there's there's different aspects, and and that's why we put in in our presentation that I mean, we just know from from all the years of doing advocacy work, you can't you can't tell anybody to do something. If they're not a part of it, there it's not gonna happen. It's gotta be a group effort to to make this change and and hopefully not to be cliche, but it is for the kids' safety, you know. What did they say in the last presentation? Oh, yeah. If Mark. you build it, they will come. And we think <laughs> the same thing about these curb extensions. Commissioner <laughs> Soros, did you have a question? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is Commissioner Mankins. Commissioner Mankins, down at the uh, Emerson School, as you obviously know, I worked down there. Um, last last summer, the Butte School District never once, boy, they spent a boatload of money down at the Emerson School by building a, uh, a curb, or kind of a bus stop, so that you know, the buses can pull in, and then it also keeps an avenue, so now the cars can go around them. Uh, and it, you know, I don't know what it's like before, but it, you know, it seems to work pretty well now. But it, again, it, they spent a 
a double ton of money down there last last summer. Yep. Okay. Commissioner Fredrickson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, great presentation. I love talking about this stuff, and I think I think you guys do a really great job of um, showing what others have done. And, and I'm looking forward to just can. To continue in this conversation because I have uh, a lot of difficult connections in in my district, and it comes up a lot with my my uh, constituents. So um, I'm looking forward to keeping the conversation moving. And I also want to thank Commissioner Che for uh, lining this up and and getting it going. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Fredrickson. Commissioner Thatcher. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, firstly, John, or Todd and Cass, thank you guys very much. I said John and Cass, geez. Um, and uh, Chairman, Sh or Commissioner Shea, you know, thank you very much for bringing this forward. Uh, as you know, my district is fairly close to Whittier School District, so um, anything that I can help out on on this, I would be happy. I think this is a great idea. All the proposals and suggestions that Cassie and Todd gave, I think, you know, I'm willing to do whatever. So just so you know that. Commissioner Shea, would you like to wrap it up? <laughs> there, oh, excuse me. I see Commissioner, Commissioner Fisher, yeah. I, thank you. Commissioner Fisher, sorry, didn't see your hand. Uh, thank you, Chairman Shaw. Thank you for the presentation. It was great. Um, and I'm not trying to rain on the parade or anything, but uh, we had an engineer for Butte Silverboat County, Nick Sanford, who done an excellent job at the Margaret Larry School. Jed Hoops was uh, in the school district, Judy Jordan and I, uh, five or seven years ago, we met just trying to get a paved path for them kids to walk or get to school because the Margaret Larry's a disaster out there. And uh, as uh, we still work on it today, but um, great ideas, but uh, it's really, really tough to get the school district in the county to work together to uh, get the financing together. And uh, when it comes down to dollar and cents, this retirement community of Youth Servo is tough to pull money out of. So great presentation. I hope for the best. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Shea. Thank you, Madam Chair. Cass and Todd, thank you so much for the number one, the very informative walking audit. It was it was pretty um, impressive to be there in person when the traffic issues are happening. And it was a little shocking to, I think, all of us that were there to see some of the behavior of the drivers and, and the kids that were trying to race across the street to not get hit and, and all of that. And um, as to uh, Commissioner Fisher, um, yes, I agree. Money is usually always the issue with a project like this, which is why we wanted to get the opinions of, of Cass and Todd, because they, they do have some inexpensive solutions we can try temporary solutions to see if they even work before we ever commit any money. Um, well, before we ever commit any large amounts of money, let me put it that way. Um, so that's what I'm looking forward to. Um, I'm really interested in the curb extensions. Um, my kids all went to Whittier School. They walked, um, well, except for Timmy. By then he, we were driving him because the traffic was so, was so heavy. I, I didn't want him walking when he was little. Um, Chief Executive Gallagher knows all about these issues because he was the principal when when one of my children was going to Whittier. And um, I have been in, co in contact with Principal Shad at Whittier, and he's very concerned as well. So I think any effort that we can take, even just taking a look at it as the first step, possibly implementing some of these low-cost temporary solutions just to see if they work is the next step. And from there, we'll partner with the school district and see if we can't come together and get something done together, which, as, as you said, Cass and Todd, together is always better. So I want to thank you guys for coming. Thank you, all commissioners, everybody that's in attendance for, for listening to the presentation and, and giving us your time. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. You bet. Thanks again. And I just want to remind everybody that there is still a communication in the Public Works Committee uh, that is the, the basis, the foundation of this presentation. And I'm sure that we'll continue with that and hopefully come up with some brainstorming. So thanks everyone. Okay, moving along to section one, communications. Uh, we have item one is communication number 2020-411. Brenda McDonough, Commissioner District 8, requesting Council of Commissioners consideration that Butte Silverboat 
take over the outside maintenance of the community ice center located at Clark Park. The original operating agreement had the Butte Amateur Hockey Association maintaining the grounds. However, I think Butte Silverbow Silver should assume the maintenance. Uh, I would like to, uh, first of all, call on Commissioner Reardon, who is the uh, district, we got district eight for district eight. And he has been in communication with some people. And then I will call on uh, Commissioner Fredrickson since he's on the Parks and Recs Board. So, Commissioner Reardon, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, in visiting with you a while back, I received a call after one of our previous meetings for uh, from Matt Benson, who is involved as Mr. Fredrickson know, and Mr. Lazary. And uh, we talked, I've done business with uh, Matt before and all that. And his concern was, is that what the people in that neighborhood really wanted and what needed to happen. And I said, well, it's being addressed by the committee in that. But he said he had some ideas that he'd like to visit with me about seeing as I was the commissioner in that area. And the number one problem or issue that I've been getting feedback on is that Butch Silver Bowl except the maintenance of the bill on this leased property. And obviously it's been abused over the last two or three years sitting next to Clark Park. So we visited about that and he said they were working with the committee and with the parks and recs to rectify that and would come up with a solution to that uh, to solve that problem. And then walking around the building and all that before Vincent called, I noticed the outside entrance area and all that was starting to uh, show its wear from not being maintained as far as painting in that. And we visited about that and he said last year, the paint had been donated to touch up the building or basically paint the building, but they came up short on the labor. So, I believe that the solution is going to be soon because acting that they have every intention of doing what they have to do to make this right. And then number two, in communication with Laz and with Pat Holland, they did a walk through, through that building and facility and the work that is going on inside from the Votech, I believe it was on the front page of the paper this morning that the inside is is really really well maintained and they basically matt touched on how economically uh this is important to the economy of butte with these uh with these hockey tournaments where the families come in there's usually 12 team tournaments with the kids motel room shopping restaurants and that <clears throat> excuse me and i assured him i i said i can't really speak for the whole council but it, is, it isn't the idea of the council to interfere in any business in that. It's just the idea that they have a lease that with Butte Silver Bowl and what the lease describes what their duties are. And that's all we're asking is that they're completed according to the lease. I also recommended why I had them on the phone is the fact it seemed like this lease was just being open when there was issues down there at the hockey arena. And any lease or contract usually has at least a two to three year period where you open up this lease, visit the property, talk to the people, and make sure everything is being maintained according to the lease. So in closing with Matt and all that, and I really, really appreciate the work of the Park and Rec, Com Rec Committee and LAS and all that, I think that their work is gonna pay off and the people living in district eight around that arena and and the building being approved will come soon so i just wanted to share that with the fellow commissioners thank you thank you commissioner reardon uh, commissioner frederickson did you want to add anything to from the point of view of the parks and recs committee well thanks madam chair i mean we we met we had our board meeting a few weeks ago um and we haven't had another one since so i don't really have uh, another update but um we did move to um take a look at the lease uh, other parks and rec uh, board members are t are taking a look at it as along with mr lazary and so i'm assuming what by, by the time our next uh board meeting we'll have more information okay thank you mm -hmm. 
Well, if anybody uh, doesn't have anything else to add, I would uh, just ask that we keep holding this in abeyance. And when we get all the factors moved together, if there is any lease amendments, that will have to go through judiciary. So we'll continue to hold this communication in abeyance. Commissioner Mankins. Thank you, Madam Shaw. Um, with the lease, could uh, County Attorney Joyce shed a little bit more light on this, seeing that um, from the information that we've uh, heard from uh, Mr. Reardon or Commissioner Reardon on this? County Attorney Joyce, would you like to comment? Is she there? <laughs> I don't, can't get my video to start, but um, <laughs> we hear you. <laughs> Madam Chair, Commissioner Minkins, um, I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to. Um, I think the lease did have some automatic um, renewal provisions in there, but um, if after um, the Park and Rec Board makes some recommendations on what kind of amendments they would like to make to the lease, um, that can be brought back before this council um for a decision on uh which terms they want to amend and that's what would have to happen i think in order to act on uh former commissioner mcdonough's communication okay follow up commissioner Mankin. no okay thank you commissioner o'neill thank you madam chair is there the possibility that the commissioners could see a copy of the lease as well i just hope we're the, you know, focused on the main thing that we're, they, we need them to mow the grass and pick up the weeds. I hope that's just the main goal here. And but I'd love to have a copy of the lease if that's a possibility. Thank you. Uh, County Attorney Joyce, could you possibly forward that to the council members so we can all have a copy of that to review as we go along? Um, Madam Chair, Commissioner O'Neill, yeah, it's um, in the clerk and recorder's office on the permanent file, but I can get a copy and forward it to the commissioners. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that uh, request. Anybody else? Okay, I think we'll just continue to hold this in advance. It looks like we are making progress. And if you look at the front page of today's paper, it had a great picture of kids, or the, I shouldn't call them kids, students working on the building on the inside. All right, moving along to item two, communication number 21-4. Demetrius Fassus, Butte Silver Bow Behavioral Health Local Advisory Council Streeting Committee, requesting Council of Commissioners authorization for the introduction of the attached resolution, which would repeal resolution number 15-45 and allow for the reformation of a more effective LAC structure. If you recall last week, we had a, a suspension of the rules where we did move to a final reading the resolution that is now taking its place. So, uh, Commissioner Fredrickson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move to cross-reference communication 21-4 with resolution 2021-03 and place on file. Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second to cross-reference communication 21-4 with resolution 21-03 and place this on file. Is there anything on the question? Okay, We is everyone ready to vote? Would everyone please vote? Would anyone like to change their vote? Would the clerk please record the vote? Looks like 12 yay and zero nay. Motion carries. Item three, communication number 21-5, Kiri Co, Historic Clark Chateau Program Director, requesting Council of Commissioners concurrence and authorization to schedule a public hearing for January 20th, 2021, for the purpose of conducting a public hearing concerning amending the fiscal year 2020-21 budget to allow for increased expenditures of unanticipated revenue in the archives Clark Chateau budget. We did have that uh, we did have that public hearing. So Commissioner Fredrickson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I make a motion to place communication 21-5 on file. Second. We have a motion and a second to place communication 21-5 on file. Is there anything on the question? Would everyone please vote? Would anyone care to change their vote? 
Would the clerk please record the vote? I'm getting there. Are we missing somebody? Looks like we're missing a couple of votes. Has everyone entered submit after their vote? Yeah, we, oh, never mind. Uh, looks like we have Tenye. Who are we missing? Commissioner Fisher? You want to give us a thumbs up, Jim? And Mr. For, uh, Commissioner Fortune. Oh, uh, can we get a voice vote for Commissioner Fortune and Commissioner Fisher? Okay, thumbs up. I couldn't see your faces there for a minute. My screen was covered up. Okay, it looks like we have 12 yay and zero nay. Motion passes. Communication 2021-20, Thomas Davis Jr., Silver Bow Tavern Association, requesting Council of Commissioners consider that this year's county licensing fees be waived, dramatically reduced, credited if already paid, and or recommendations on other means to help mitigate the burden to our small business owners. This would be for all beverage license or beer and wine license, Silver Bow County retail food license, and catering special events license. And I invited Mr. Davis to speak about this at first before we go to our um, finance and budget director. So, Mr. Davis, are you on? I think I saw him earlier. Yes, there he is. Are you on mute, Tom? I, we can't hear you yet. <laughs> okay, thank you, there Madam you go. Chair. There you go. Perfect. Thank you. Um, first and foremost, I want to start off by thanking, um, thanking you all for allowing us to be here and on the agenda. Um, like, uh, like you mentioned, my name is Thomas Davis and my family and I own um, a small business here in Butte. I'm accompanied by Deb Dennis, um, who's a manager over at Crazy Carol's um, Casino and also a member of the Silver Bow Tavern Association. So um, as I'm, I'm the newly elected uh, president of the Silver Bow Tavern Association, and um, basically, the Tavern Association is a nonprofit organization that's comprised of the bars, taverns, and restaurants, casino owners, and their representatives that hold an active liquor license, gaming, and appropriate business license in order to conduct business in Silver Bow County. Um, moreover, the Silver Bow Tavern Association works with the state representatives, lobbyists, to achieve various goals and preserve, protect, and enhance our liquor and gaming um, and hospitality industry and establishments around Silver Bow and also Montana. Um, I want to take this time and opportunity to um, give you guys an understanding of what the restrictions and the health requirements and so forth has, has taken an impact on our industry. Um, with that being said, like uh, the restrictions at 10 p.m., I know that's a hot topic around our county. In addition, you know, the ordinance is coming from the health department where 10 p.m. Um, we're looking at trying not to get the individuals too intoxicated after 10 p.m. that has been brought up. However, if you look at other um, areas, they are able to go to convenience stores, okay. liquor stores, still purchase alcohol. So then therefore, a lot of our consumers and our public are going to um, uncontrolled um, environments where there's no social distancing, there's no cleaning. However, we follow all of our businesses that are trying to do our due diligence and public safety and we actually have a controlled environment. So I wanted to point that out. Um, uh, with the governor, uh, with our governor lifting many of the um, mandates across Montana, our county is still under strict restrictions. Um, I know that they're possibly reevaluating our COVID cases and our solar restrictions possibly around February 10th. February 10th. However, um, they may be ongoing and I know speaking with a lot of the other business owners and the tavern owners and also people that hold liquor license and so forth, uh, they're on the verge and plea. And a lot of them are possibly going to shutter and or don't have the opportunities or the, the, the understanding that they're, main, that they're having a hard time coping with everything that's going on. I know that they've 
pretty much what I've heard and what I've been counseled on is a lot of people have um, exhausted all opportunities and uh, they don't know where else to lean or stand, uh, you know, state, state their case. Um, so do you want to add anything on this? Well, I would just like to say that on the 10 o'clock mandate, um, I think that if we could at least have the county health department work with us just a bit on lifting just one mandate to possibly stay open until 1230. I think that would probably relieve probably 95% of the tension in the town between the small businesses and the health department and the mandates. Um, I know that they said that after 10 o'clock with alcohol induces bad behavior, yet there are a couple liquor stores that are allowed to stay open until 1230 to where the people leave the bar at 10 o'clock, they go to the liquor store, they buy a bottle, they go to the house party, the masks come off, the bottle gets passed around, the cigarettes are shared, and there's no controlled environment. So part of the frustration for some of the tavern and restaurant owners is that our alcohol and liquor, the same thing, um, they feel like there's a little contradiction. So we did have a business meeting of about 25 people uptown at Sonia Welling's place here a month or so ago in the hopes that um, our frustrations were heard. Maybe we could all be proactive and work together. And we've heard nothing since the meeting. Um, and we did hear that um, they were gonna reevaluate after February 10th. In the meantime, uh, people are leaving the bars in Silver Bow County at 10 o'clock and they're going to Anaconda. I do know our Cornhole League has moved it from Butte, has moved their Cornhole League to Deer Lodge. And I personally have a family member that plays in that league that told, I said, well, how'd you guys do coming back from Deer Lodge? Uh, they were doing shots and they were drinking it and they drove back. So therefore that opens up the UIs, Rex. Um, I just, I just think that if we could get some help with just lifting at least the 1230 mandate, uh, some, some of the doors will be able to stay open and a lot of frustration between these owners and the county would, would probably lift a lot. So, uh, the uh, so Tom, I, I don't mean to interrupt you, but you know, your communication actually is directed toward a specific action that you're asking us to take. And I really, personally feel your pain. I understand the situation that, you know, the bars and, and a lot of businesses all over town are are experiencing, but we really need to kind of stick to the script, if you don't mind. And thank you for all your comments, don't get me wrong. But I, I would like to direct uh, your attention okay. to your action the that licensing. you're about the licenses, okay? Okay, so the licensing, um, our hours of operation for the licensing are, you know, legally 8 a.m. to 2 a.m and we haven't been able to stay we're, we're losing four hours there of of revenue so that's why we've concluded and also why we mentioned all these to topics is it just really kind of um it, it points in the direction of what the frustration is and then also circles back on why we are requesting this you know either waiving or some reduction and or some type of assistance from the county and also the sympathy and then also good faith from our, um, our, you know, our city officials and so forth, having a deep understanding of what we're going through as small businesses, especially for many of the businesses in our industry, we're quite a bit where we are uh, uh, employment statistics and also a lot of these businesses are the backbone for the economy here in Silver Bow County. So that's just something that we wanted to kind of get across the board. Okay, and we thank you for that. So uh, if there are no questions directly to either Tom or Deb, I would ask, uh, to have our, actually, Commissioner Fisher asked, and I thank you, Commissioner Fisher, that we have our county, uh, our finance and budget director speak on the actual licensing, the amount of money that we, that we do take in, where it goes, and just a general overview of the licensing itself. So if I could call on uh, Ms. Gleason, appreciate it, thank you. Sure. Um, Madam Chair, Commissioners, for the record, Danette Gleason, the finance and budget director for Beat Silver Bow. Um, I also have invited Lori Patrick to join in on me with me because I can kind of give you the financial aspects of it, but the treasurer is responsible for issuing these licenses and she will have the background and details. And then 
um, how some of the different um, combinations of licensings are issued. And then County Attorney Joyce has also um, helped us out on this. So um, just to start out with, on average, uh, the local government collects approximately $150,000 annually for these type of business licenses that includes all business licenses and Lori will get into the numbers but it's roughly 2,000 licenses a year um, in the liquor licenses we collect around 25,000 and the beer and wine licenses is around 11,400 but as Lori will mention to you that some of these establishments and facilities don't just pay a certain um, bucket for for say a liquor license or a beer and wine they pay a combination um, of different types of licensing. Um, the ordinance is ordinance uh, five. I had sent that out to the commissioners this evening along with um, the detail of the annual, actually the calendar year licenses that were collected last year in 20. Uh, the treasurer's office is currently just processing 21 licenses, so I don't have those exact dollars right now for you. Um, Lori, I think I'll let you jump in and talk a little bit how the licensing works and how these different allocations work. Thank you, Budget Director Gleason, um, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Um, yes, this is a big burden on our community for our small businesses and I do understand and thank you um, for putting in your communication so that uh, we had a discussion regarding this. So um, an all beverage license is a $400 a year license for our um, bars that do have or um, that do have an all beverage license. Beer and wine is $200. Uh, beer only is $100. Wine only is $100. Along with um, these licenses, there is also um, they're casinos, which we don't collect a fee in Buttes over Bow. That's all through the state of Montana. So um, that is revenue that we do not receive. But um, if the business is also uh, selling things like food um, or clothing, they also have to have a general business license, depending on how many employees they have. So two, uh, one to two employees is a $35 a year license three to five is 50 um then it goes to six to 20 for a hundred dollars so it, it can get quite expensive for some of these businesses um lydia's for example they pay 400 dollars for their business license they have uh 21 to 35 employees so they pay another 150 dollars for the year so 550 dollars for the year so yeah with um these establishments closing at 10 o'clock i can totally see um where this is affecting a lot of our our bars um we as danette did say we're making about one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in revenue um, and that's all general business licenses however i don't feel that it would be um fair to the other businesses that are struggling if we were just to do something for the alcohol industry. I think we would have to do something for all of our businesses. May, may I, may I just... Thank you, Lori. Uh, sure, um, Mr. Davis. So thank you, Lori. And um, also in taking into consideration, also speaking on uh, behalf of our industry, um, other businesses um, are, some of them are actually thriving due to the fact that we, as far as casinos and some of the restaurants have to shut down early. Um, the reason why we brought up those mandates and restrictions from the health department earlier, just to highlight that, um, is our industry more importantly feels like we're targeted and or we're limited and our plea of cries has been gone unanswered. So therefore, I think that our industry is impacted the most throughout the community. And I may be misspoken on that, but um, with the 10 o'clock curfew and restrictions, um, bars, casinos, and restaurants are pretty much the ones that are affected by that um, mandate. And that's all, thank you. Commissioner Thatcher. Thank you. Um, Deb, Thomas, thanks for coming. Um, I guess I just have a couple quick questions um, for Lori. Um, I guess it's my understanding that these fees, is this true? I, I was talking to a, a, a bar owner, I guess, and 
Um, she had mentioned that it is required to pay these dues by January 31st, and if they're not paid, it increases by whatever that following, or is that within the state? Um, thank Ms. you, Patrick. Commissioner. Oh, sorry. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner Thatcher. Yes, we do um, charge a fee afterwards, and it I believe it doubles. I don't have that in front of me. Thank you for asking that question. Um, but we are so lenient on this. As a matter of fact, we have a bar in our uh, community that is open to the public and has not paid for a year and a half. So, and that's not even including the 2021. So, yes, that does say that on their business license renewal. Uh, I can't, in my administration, uh, that I'm aware of that we ever charge double for them not paying by January 31st. Follow up, Commissioner Thatcher. Okay, yes, yeah, thank you for that, Lori. Um, so I guess obviously, Deb, I mean, Thomas, I see both sides of this too. You know, I, I understand both sides of this as well. Um, I, I guess what I, I struggle with is, um, I guess would be, you know, it's, it's a fee. Yes. And I understand that businesses are, are being, you know, closed down, but where would where would we this other revenue be generated from if if we just waived them i guess i mean what would be your guys's best i guess option i mean that one hundred fifty thousand dollars is kind of a lot of money i i would say i don't know what do you think tom did you want to answer that um i think i don't think you did you hear it all? No, I didn't hear it all. Forgive me, but um, maybe Deb has. I didn't hear it. We didn't get a good chance to hear it. We were kind of discussing a couple of things. Could you repeat Dr. your Rick, question? I you apologize. repeat your question. So I was just wondering if, if, I mean, businesses are required to pay these fees and $150,000 collected by the county obviously is used for the purposes of uh, several things within the county. So what would be your suggestion to cover the costs that this money is typically used for. Tom, you want to answer that? Uh, absolutely. So um, the fees and stuff was just pretty much a basis of getting us, you know, something in the order of uh, some kind of, I guess, uh, re relief time. and also being heard in this in the situation. I don't will foresee or understand the budgets what you guys, you know, have to collectively overlook. I don't. I couldn't. I couldn't sit here and say you have to take from this pool to in order for us to, um, I guess, uh, benefit from. But overall, I think our stance on this is we just want to be able to present this in front of, you know, our council and commissioners, and also understand the burden that we're going through. But in addition, um, a lot of these. I mean, when we collect our finances and stuff, now that we are less than those four hours, that's a. a that's less monetary value that we're having coming in. I don't know if you want to. Well, we don't have any bar business anymore with the mandate. We've lost all of our, because we've had to remove our stools. So the only, you know, alcohol we are serving with is to our casino uh, patrons. We have zero bar business since we've reopened. And with the limited amount of uh, the um, return on our investment and also the money coming in and stuff, uh, no other agencies and or utilities and stuff gets relief. They don't, you know, it's, we have to pay our bills regardless. We have to pay our taxes and stuff. And according to, you know, our liquor license, we it goes till 2 a.m. So we're, we have a mass reduction in that. So it's give and take on both sides. So I think that's where we're coming across more importantly. I'm, I'm not sure if I directly answered your question. I don't think there's an all, a fit all, you know, explanation and or answer. I'm going to call on our... Uh, finance and budget director, and then uh, Ms. Thatcher, I will call on you after that, okay? Um, Madam Chair, um, just to get to Commissioner Thatcher's um, question that she was asking from a local government budget standpoint, we balance our budget using the estimated $150,000 um, annual licensing. So today, um, just from technical aspect of how the budget works, that is balancing it used to balance our budget. So if we were to not have these funds um, in to 
balance out, then we would have to either look for another source of revenue um, or we'd have to be looking at other budgets that we potentially may have to reduce in order to cover these costs. Or the final would be to look at reserve funds to fill back into these lost revenues. I hope that kind of helped you on our standpoint, how we balance the budget. Commissioner Thatcher, follow up. I just wanted to tell Deb and Thomas, thank you guys. Like I, I get it where you guys are coming from for sure. So I appreciate it. I, those are just my questions for you. So thank you. And thank you, Budget Director Gleason. Commissioner thank Fisher you. and then Commissioner Anderson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair Shaw. Thank you, Tom and Deb. Um, Treasurer Lori and Danette. As you can see, it's a contentious yes. issue and um, Chief Executive Gallagher is working to try and resolve the issue of getting to, you know, lighten up on the restrictions a little bit. The COVID's going down. As you can see between the Tavern Owners Association, the bar and restaurant people, this is a chess game right now. And this is the only way they have a chance to get to the elected officials to get us to do something because we don't have a say on the Board of Health. We have one member and that's our Madam Chair, Ms. Shaw, serves on the Board of Health. So a lot of these decisions that are being made are being made by the Board of Health. And a lot of people in the community think that the commissioners are making these decisions. Uh, Budget Director Gleason sent out a very extensive report today that shows all of the money, how it's spent, who spends what, how many employees you gotta have. It's a very extensive thing that needs to be looked at. And uh, we're not gonna be taking any action on this tonight. But uh, as many of you know, my family owns a couple of bars in Butte and they are also suffering. And uh, I just think that it's a chess game right now. And I do think that this brings it to our attention. And I think what's gotta happen is we've gotta see what Chief Executive Gallagher comes up with prior to our next meeting where we would take action on something like this. And everyone should read during the week what uh, Budget Director Gleason has sent out because it's very informative. And I would hope that uh, Tom and Deb and some of the tavern owners get a copy of that so we can see, but I really understand both sides of this story and I don't see resolution within the council uh, without having the Board of Health and uh, Chief Executive Gallagher weighing in fully. So at this time, um, everyone can uh, speak their piece, but I think uh, it's gonna be a week before we really gotta make any decisions, but there's a lot of information out there from both sides and I hope everyone looks at it. Thank you once again, Tom and Deb, and thank you, Treasurer thank Baker. You. Uh, and Thank you, Danette Gleason. Appreciate it. Commissioner Anderson. Let me go to unmute. Thank you. I, I think one of the things is, is that we were asking, uh, we were asking Tom where we expect to make up the revenue. And I think what he's kind of asking us is, you know, you know we're supposed to be here to help the citizens in our community. And a lot of those citizens are these business owners who are trying to operate and thrive in a very difficult uh, situation. And unfortunately, a situation made all the worse by uh, some of the mandates that we put in place. Some of them, I believe, are very justified. Some of them, I think, are kind of silly. Uh, that, that being said, I think what he's really trying to figure out is they're losing, we're losing 100,000 if we wipe out their fees for these uh, places, we'd lose 150,000. I'm thinking a lot of these, that's a small, small, small percentage of our annual budget. I think when we look at the losses that these businesses are incurring, that's a major portion. I would say that we're losing this percentage, uh, part of a percentage point or two, and they're losing 10, 20% of their operational budget. And it's really putting a lot of stress on this. You know, it's not only, it's not even just a local problem. It's something going around statewide and across the nation. When you look at the evening news, you can't help but see buildings boarded up where businesses were. You know, you look in California, I was, uh, I don't know who was at St. Patrick's Church or listened to Father Patrick Beretta's homily last week. He was talking about a restaurant he worked at and it was just ransacked, you know, it was boarded up and then people got in there and just completely destroyed it. 
and these businesses all across the nation, and especially in our community, which is already depressed, are suffering greatly. And I think we don't need to really ask them how you can fix our budget, but we need to ask them how we can fix theirs and help them out a little bit. Thank you. Commissioner Thatcher. Thank you. I don't want it to get misconstrued. I, I guess my question was probably taken in that way that it wasn't intended to. So I just want to make that clear that I wasn't asking Thomas and, and uh, Deb to make up our $150,000 budget. I guess I was just more so searching for information that uh, Budget Director Gleason provided me with. So thank you. Commissioner Anderson, you. did you have a follow-up? Uh, and then, then Commissioner O'Neill. Go ahead. I'm good. I'll revert to Commissioner O'Neill. Okay. Commissioner O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Tommy and, and Deb for, you know, coming and speaking with us. We really appreciate that. Uh, my question would be to either um, um, Lori Patrick or um, Danette would be if we could we put a pause on the fees to let them pay them later. Um, um, you know, extend the fee for a later time for when they're back making big money. Is that, is that a possibility? Who would like to answer that? Lori, Patrick? Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner O'Neill. Um, I don't know if the answer would be, and um, Deb and Tom, don't get me wrong. I, I totally understand your situation. I, I have a family that owns a biz business and, and understand how everybody's struggling. But um, I don't know if the answer is push back the time frame, uh, but maybe credit back the businesses that do pay in a timely manner, um, maybe give them a little bit more of an extension into February, and then those businesses that absolutely did pay refund the Monday. I don't know if that's a possibility. Thank you. So, um, uh, I just, Oh, I'm sorry. Commissioner O'Neill, did you have a follow-up? Oh. Go ahead. No, then, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm in deep thought now. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Reardon, did you have your hand up? Uh, yes, I do. Thank you, Commissioner Shaw. Uh, I guess I'll just to interject a few things here. I think that from the arguments I've heard or the presentations is the fact that we have to be fair to everybody that holds a license for a business at this time. And I think we should take that in consideration. The restrictions to these businesses, my, I have a, a bar owner in my family too, is the fact in that it isn't their choice. What they're trying to do is, if you remember when this thing first started out, the bars were buttoned up tight. It's a health concern. And I guess my question to Tom and Deb, I would be interested uh, putting this to you as you being a new president of how many of these businesses have actually received any um, money from these programs offered by the government, the stimulus money. And I think that that might be an interesting thing to look at. Have these people been putting in through these programs or not? But when you really look at it, my heart goes out. I see it every day. There's people starting to lose their homes now and all that stuff. But we also have to be fair to everybody that has a business and purchases a licensing. And I think that basically what we're dealing with here back to the this is a health issue. And I believe that the bar business and maybe a lot of bar owners won't agree with me has come a long way from where it started when this epidemic broke out. So I would be interesting as you with the Montana Tavern Association is seeing how many what is the percentile of, of Butte bar owners that have put in and received any money from the stimulus program as we go on. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I do agree with you, Commissioner Reardon, that you know, there are possibilities of businesses getting, um, I'm sure that there is programs if there's, if, if any of them haven't gone into them, they, they definitely need to look at all the different funds out there for them. Um, but still whether, um, I, mean, I, I hate to say that I, mean, I don't. I don't see how we can refund fees, or maybe we can waive late fees or something. But 
I mean, it, obviously it has to, um, you know, and, and all business, you know, the, the, you know, Montana is a business too, and we have to get our fees to, to run. But um, I, mean, I guess it, it keep thinking on how we could work with these guys because they are definitely bars are struggling. That is the issue. Um, if you look at the, the anybody serving food, it's probably doing okay right now with pickup and delivery. Um, but I guess I'm going in the weeds here that um, I just I don't want to like throw it on the fact if you know if this guy got whatever money is in the back, it has to just come down to uh, what what could we do to help him out, whether if it's on fees or not. I just want to make sure we, we look at it that way. So thank you. Thank you, Tom and Deb, for being here. Uh, I just want to say I am on the Board of Health, and I'm just going to tell you we are calling a special meeting next week. Uh, I'm not sure the date exactly, but just to be continued, uh, just so you know, uh, we will hold this in abeyance. We will not let this communication go away. We're going to leave it where it is on our on our agenda, as Commissioner Fisher suggested. But uh, as far as I know, uh, we are in the process of planning a special Board of Health meeting for next week. Any other questions for Tom or Deb? Commissioner Shea. Thank you, Madam Chair. Not really a question. Um, I've just been listening with great um, intent, trying to understand. And um, I wanna thank Tom and Deb for coming tonight. I think you are doing an admirable job of representing your group. And um, that's something they should be very grateful for. Um, I want to thank you for your sacrifices that you've made during the pandemic for the sake of public health. I know it has not been easy. I know a lot of people who are in the service industry. Um, and so my sympathy does go out to you. And I do want you to know that I recognize and honor your sacrifices um, for the good of everybody. Um, unfortunately, the pandemic has been a little inequitable to businesses. Like you said, some businesses are thriving. Um, and other businesses are barely hanging on by the skin of their teeth. And so I just want you to know that I recognize that and thank you for being here. Thank you. Stay tuned. So at this Can time, just, we, oh, I'm sorry. Did, Deb, did you want to say something? Say one, you certainly yeah, may. Just maybe, just maybe for your meeting. Um, so help And it is a public uh, meeting, so they will allow people oh, to call in, yes. Okay, okay, because I just want to bring up with Silver Bowl County having to close at 10 also and them going to other counties where they're not having to wear the masks over there and not distance and stuff, then they're, you know, they can get it over there and bring it back to our county again. So I just, I just thought of that. So I thought I'd throw that out there for. Okay. Well, just keep your eye on for the meeting announcement. It'll be in the paper. Okay. Thank you. And thank you for listening. And, you bet. and we're thankful we have this avenue. Thank you. We're all in this together, trust us. <laughs> okay, yes, again, we will, we will continue to hold this in abeyance and we'll move on to item five, communication number 2021-48, Angie Mulliken, Public Works, Budget Analyst, requesting Council of Commissioners concurrence and authorization to schedule a bid opening for February 3rd, 2021 for the hot mix asphalt supply for the 2021 season. The hot mix is used to repair and resurface roads throughout Butte Silver Bow. We will continue to hold that until next week's meeting, February 3rd. Item six, communication number 2021-49, Angie Mulliken, Public Works Budget Analyst, requesting Council of Commissioners concurrence and authorization to schedule a bid opening for February 10th, 2021 for the dig and replacement of sewer lines on Clark, Zerelda, Alabama, Hornet, Waukesha, Quartz, Rampart, and Cedar Lake streets. We will hold that till our uh, bid opening occurring in two weeks on February 10th. At this time, we are reached the point where we can take public comment on any public matter not on tonight's agenda. I do have two letters to read into the record. Uh, it looks as though we don't have any phone calls. So if I do, I'm sure Josh will give me the high sign. In the meantime, I will read these two letters into the record. First is from Dr. John W. Ray, 915 West Galena Street, Butte, Montana. In this winter of discontent and disease, those individuals and groups that often go unpraised need to be praised for helping to keep us safe. Often they receive only vituperation for their exercise of public virtue. We can never thank them enough. We can never praise them enough. That is why I'm writing this note that I would like read at the next Council of Commissioners meeting to provide some public recognition and thanks for the work these people are doing to protect the public's health and safety, which task is the highest purpose of government. 
This letter was occasioned by my reading the article about the award that BARC gave to the Butte Health Department, which article mentioned the personal attacks, threats, and vituperation members of the health department have had to endure during this crisis. Of course, those who resort to these attacks are unable to argue an issue on the merits and because of their cupidity or ignorance must resort to personal invective. While no public groups are beyond criticism, such criticism should be given with civility and based on facts and evidence, not personal bias. Public health is concerned with maintaining the well being of the public, the common good, and the general wel welfare. While I know people are hurting, we will never overcome this pestilence unless we persevere. It takes courage to do so. I am not mentioning all who are worthy of praise, like our first responders, youth medical and nursing and medical technician staff, police, etc. I want to single out those who often not only get little or no praise, but are subject to personal threats, invective, and vilification. First, I would like to deeply thank the Health Department and the Board of Health. What a difficult and thankless job they are doing for us. In return, they only get attacked by some misguided individuals whose view of the extent of personal freedom is ludicrous or are interested only in their profit, not the public good. What selfish people these are. Fortunately, our Health Department and the Board of Health have done their duty, have kept the faith, and have run a true course. I have many friends and relatives who live in various parts of the country in cities large and small. When I tell them about the work of our Health Department and Board of Health, they are amazed at the outstanding work they are doing. We should be truly thankful in Butte. We must also remember the great work of the Southwest Community Health Center in St. James. They are unbelievable community assets without which we would truly be in public despair. My friends, we are nowhere near the end of this, but we must persevere or our efforts will be in vain. <clears throat> Second, I want to thank local government, which has been supportive of the efforts to protect public health. You have not succumbed to insulting personal attacks, but have been steadfast in your resolve to protect our safety. It is hard, it is difficult, it is often unrecognized, but I, as a citizen, want you to know how deeply appreciated you are. The idea behind good citizenship is that one puts aside his or her private concerns and acts for the good of all out of a sense of public duty and concern. Members of local government are truly good citizens who act on their citizenship duty of being civilly engaged. Third, I want to thank our local media, which in very difficult times has kept us informed. I particularly want to thank the print media, Montana Standard and Butte Weekly, as well as KBOW. Without your information, we would be in the dark about what is happening. If, it, if we were in the dark, wild rumors and panic would take hold. The media is suffering from all of the economic dislocation that we are experiencing, but have kept doing their job in an exemplary manner. manner. Where would we be, for example, without the Montana Standards daily updates about the nature and extent of the pandemic? What is being done to combat it? How we can be involved and what needs improvement and how we have seen exemplary cases of triumph and unselfish behavior. Although it only comes our, out weekly, the Butte Weekly has kept us informed. We do have a patriotic duty to read the paper and listen to local news on KBOW. If we are to perform our civic duty and be civilly engaged, we must be informed. The main source of information is the media, and we have excellent local media. Fourth, I want to thank the teachers. As I know personally, the current conditions make teaching stressful, difficult, and challenging. But teachers are meeting the challenge and still in their providing, and still in their providing quality education and careful concern for our students. I was moved by the story of the young forensic student continuing under very difficult conditions to remain engaged in debate and speech activities. Another big thank you to all of our teachers. I could continue, and I know I have not mentioned all, but I wanted to mention these four because they often go unrecognized or downright attacked for performing their duty. One citizen, me, certainly appreciates what you are doing. And this is a quote from Blaise Pascal. He that takes truth for his guide and duty for his end may safely trust to God's providence to lead him aright. The second letter <clears throat> that I'm reading into the record is from Eldon Beal. Um, he is located at 315 South Dakota Street, Butte, Montana. Madam Chair, Cindy Shaw, Council of Commissioners, I have recently sent emails to Chief Executive J.P. Gallagher and his Chief of Staff, Jim Cambage, about the old Townsend property that was lost to back taxes. Again, the tax deed resolution that took a year to develop was a waste of time with this property. The new owner doesn't seem to care what goes on with that property either. It just keeps getting worse, not better. 
Last night, one of the regulars that goes back and forth between that house and 213 South Dakota was so drunk she fell down past my vehicle, got up and ripped the extension cord of the front off the front and was attempting to throw it through my windshield. My next door neighbor was on his porch and witnessed the whole thing and yelled at her and also did the person she was walking with. Butte Silver Bow law enforcement was called and was warned. After she walked away, she came back and was taken to the hospital by law enforcement. All of this could have been avoided and all the other issues if the city, county, attorney's office, community enrichment evicted them before the tax deed resolution and would have saved a lot of headaches. My next communication to the Council of Commissioners will be to address these public nuisance properties and be able to go after the owners and or property management companies when there has been no there has been known complaints of drug activity and other illicit and illegal activities. Eldon Beale, 315 South Dakota. And that concludes the uh, letters to be read into the record. Uh, do we have any other public comment? It looks like we don't. So uh, at this time, I don't know if there's anything to come before us other than adjourning. So I would uh, ask for an adjournment. So moved. We have a second. 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 We have a motion and a second to adjourn. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for sticking around, and have a wonderful evening. I'll see you next week. Good night. Bye, everyone. Everybody. Good night. Have a good evening.